And we're live back here, fellas, uh, with what I like to call the Catholic Masculinity Show, but it's actually CMAS, Christian Masculism, created by Timothy Gordon. He brought us all together. You see him down in the bottom right hand of the corner. And every week we get together and we talk on topics related to masculinity uh, within the frame of Christianity. And uh, I like to say Catholic masculinity because it rhymes. I like alliteration. It just rolls off my damn tongue. But really, we're all ordered towards Christ in our uh, our path here as men living on this planet that seems to um, be at odds with most of what we uh, as Christian men believe and are put here to do. And so today I want to talk about one of the attacks that has been brought to the public's attention with regard to uh, conception, uh, reproduction. Uh, it seems like it's a part of the gender wars. And that is these new studies that have come out that have shown that sperm count has dropped precipitously over the past 50 years. In fact, they're saying it has dropped 50% in the past 50 years. Just so you know, I'm not making this up or reiterating news from memes. I was joking earlier before, that's where I get most of my news, scrolling on memes. But I actually did some quote unquote research, right? Everybody has Google. So I looked up and there have been recent articles. First one here is on Euro News. Sperm count drop is accelerating worldwide and threatens the future of mankind. Study warm, so we're gonna talk about that. Sperm count worldwide has ha has halved over the past five decades, and the pace of the decline has more than doubled since the turn of the century, new research shows. That's one news source. We also have The Guardian here, and The Guardian, uh, this is an article from, all of these are from earlier this week. This was um, the 11th. Hum or, or last week, humans could face reproductive crisis as sperm counts decline. Global figures suggest sperm concentration has halved in 40 years and the rate of decline is accelerating. A study published in the Journal of Human Reproduction Update based on 153 estimates from men who are probably unaware of their fertility suggests that average sperm concentration fell from an estimated 101.2 mls per ml to 49 mls per ml between 1973 and 2018. A drop of 51.6% total sperm count fell 60 through 0.3% during the same time period. And then finally, I'll bring up one more and then we can get into what might be going on here and why. This is from USA Today. This was November 15th. Sperm counts are decreasing, study finds. What might it mean for fertility? New study found men are likely to have lower sperm count than just 50 years ago. The reason? Experts say it's hard to tell, but it may be due to environmental exposures, chemicals, or changes in weight. Being healthy overall is an important uh, part of reproductive health. Experts say men should talk to their doctors if they're concerned about their sperm count. So I thought this was a good topic to discuss in light of our Agenda 2030 talk uh, a few weeks ago and how uh, we're asserting that perhaps female sports is a means by which to uh, depopulate the planet. <laughs> Sounds kind of crazy, but if you watch the show, it's not that much of a stretch. But this is sort of a direct attack and very obvious. Sperm counts are dropping. And I use the word attack, but I want to back up for a minute, and I don't want to sound like a conspiracy theorist right away. I want to throw it to my panel and ask the fellas, what do you guys speculate might be the reason for this dramatic drop in sperm count over just the last 50 years? And I open that up to any one of you guys who want to pick up that ball right away. So the first thing I want to point out is that the, the drop in sperm count 
might not mean a drop in fertility. So the link between the two might not be as strong as some people are claiming. Mm. And the reason that I think that's worth bearing in mind is if we look at abortion rates, that is the main reason why fertility is below replacement. So if it wasn't for abortion, the US, the UK, European countries, which have currently got way below fertility replacement rate, which is 2.1, a lot of European countries are around one. If it wasn't for abortion, we'd be at replacement. So women are getting impregnated, but they're just not actually having the baby. They're aborting it instead. So these men with low sperm counts, they're still getting women pregnant. So that's the first thing I want to point out. But obviously sperm count is dropping, whether or not it affects fertility. So I'd look at environmental factors, stress, for example, the different kind of jobs that guys are doing now, not so much manual labor, maybe more office jobs, sustained stress, environmental factors like you mentioned, is it smoking, alcohol, basically symptoms of modern consumerist industrial society. Yeah, that's a good point to uh, assert that, yeah, we're not necessarily talking about a drop in fertility, right? The planet seems to be still bubbling with people popping up all over the place. Uh, it just seems that there's a shift in demographics. I'm curious if these studies, well, they said that the study is international, so worldwide, like not just Western civilization. In previous studies, it showed that just in the West and Western and civilized countries that it was dropping, but now it's worldwide. So that's also unique. I'll, ju I'll jump in with uh, a more conspiratorial angle on this, Elliot. What's up, everyone? Good morning. Uh, Malthusianism is very real. Everyone should Google this since you've got your Google bar near you. The idea that the world's population is too high was, was popularized sometime around the, the late 40s in the post-war milieu of Europe and America when intellectuals sweepingly decided that mankind is bad, we're cockroaches on the planet. They popularized this idea of Malthusianism that um, the, the world's population is going to explode and it seems now with the luxury of retrospect that ev every different pet project of the global left since 1945, 46, 47, 48 has centered around this thesis, lowering the procreativity of the world, men and women. Something, I won't mention what, um, over the last two and a half years, Elliot, has lowered female fertility by as much as 83% in, in a lot of Western countries. Look at Australia, people. Look at the birth rate in Australia. And when they look back at 2021, 20, 22, they're going to see less babies born than ever before by, by a staggering factor. Um, so I don't know exactly, besides events that have happened in the last two years, what they may be doing. Uh, assuming that there is some correlation between sperm count and, and male uh, fertility. You know, Will was presenting an alternative theory or maybe something that could be happening at the same time. But also male testosterone has uh, lowered dramatically. My, my best friend's doctor, dad is a doctor, and he said he's never seen such low testosterone counts. And female uh, uh, procreativity, of course, in the last two years because of wink, wink, something has been is just plummeted. So I, I subscribe to the general theory that whenever there are folks telling you our main goal is we want to kill you, we, you know, we want to wipe you off the map. Listen, when people tell you they want to eliminate your population through procreation, listen, whenever people tell you they want to do anything to you and they're openly admitting that they view you as some sort of sacrificial holocaust and by this i mean the people of the world it's really their their elite uh government actors that are telling them the same message 
there are too many people on planet Earth. We want to lower procreation. And then Agenda 2030 is pretty out in the open with all its sustainable development goals, all of which are geared toward getting people not to have babies. And we have this conspicuous, uh, it rhymes with vaccination process that is having widespread sweeping global effects. It seems like all of this is in concert, just saying. Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. I noticed uh, another meme I saw the other day with a chart <laughs> that showed all cause mortality for men between the ages of 30 and 40 has risen per a lot. And then also, I, I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but I've seen so many couples who have lost their babies over the past year or two. I mean, it's, it's outrageous how yeah. many stillborns are, uh, are happening. So there's definitely something going on there. Uh, Michael, I'd love to hear your thoughts on why perhaps sperm count, is, you know, we never really, we haven't really touched on what may be some of the issues, you know, like Will did in a, in a moment, but you know, why do you think as an athlete, and as a manly man, why are our uh, seeds dropping? Yeah, I think uh, I think Will hit on the head when he used the term the, the industrialized West, you know. So I think that there's certainly, definitely, if this is a side effect of urbanization, of, uh, you know, being away from nature, uh I mean, obviously more specifics, you know, you look at like heavy plastics in the water, the standard American diet where everyone's eating processed foods and, and you know, soy, soybean based, uh, uh, you know, plant um, products uh, and getting away from animal fat and stuff that would otherwise uh, be sustaining testosterone and, and natural healthy fats. Um, I think plastics in the water, I think is a huge thing in, in particular, there was one study in London where they were finding that the, uh, the women's birth control, you know, London recycles their, their water. So it was the theory was that the birth control, uh, that the women were urinating out into the, um, the, uh, water was being recycled back through the, um, faucets and the, the trace amounts of that was affecting uh, male sperm count in, in London. Um, so I think, you know, th th these are all just downstream side effects of, of the industrialized West. And, uh, uh, that would probably be my theory as to how it is that testosterone rates are going down, but then certainly as Tim mentioned, there's all sorts of factors and ethos, uh, at play that, wants to nudge this along and sees it as a good thing. I don't know about you guys, but I remember uh, as a young man, I guess maybe in my early teens, uh, actually, I don't know where I heard it or why I believed it, but somehow I picked up on the idea that human beings are a cancer to the planet. And I believed that. You know, I was an impressionable kid and anything that was that sounded counterculture, I picked up on. It's probably part of the reason why I'm here now, because the tables have turned. It turns out that that was being pumped into our soft brains uh, for at least the past two generations. I accepted that wholeheartedly, mm -hmm. along with a lot of other um, life negating ideas like the right to abort children. Uh, contraception. When I was a kid, this was when Dr. Kavarkian came about and he was a big um, controversy because you should be allowed to kill yourself. Uh, I'm curious if you guys ever in your lives, you know, maybe I think maybe you guys were mostly, uh, at least I know Tim were, was, no, actually I think all you guys are reverts, but was there ever a point where you guys uh, felt as if or, 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 subscribe to that idea that maybe there is maybe we shouldn't be here maybe there's too much of us maybe uh maybe they do need to depopulate a little bit and may and, and maybe scientifically that is true today i wonder what you guys thoughts are right we're going on nine billion are there too many of us what's going on when i was uh in academia in particular at oxford this 
this ethic was pervasive everywhere. And I would say, I mean, you can see it also in like the language of uh, AOC's uh, Green New Deal. But it's essentially, I think, once you take on the identity of, you know, we're not members of a family anymore. We're not members of a country. We're all global citizens, right? We're, we're, all, we're all just one big global family. And, uh, you know, wouldn't it be selfish of you? Wouldn't it be selfish of you to, to procreate and have, have your own family when we know that, you know, the, all of us collectively are struggling at 9 billion and, you know, the money that you would be sending yeah, to your kids literally uh, practice that could go to a uh, hundred uh, mosquito nets that could save a hundred lives uh, from malaria uh, somewhere in Africa. Uh, how dare you be so selfish? Having a family is selfish. Uh, we're glo we're global citizens now, right? So that was that was sort of the ethic that if if the, your moral aperture is now extended to this this global view, and you're not <coughs> allowed to be partial, it's unethical to be partial towards faith family flag, uh, and you need to take on this new globalized world, uh, one world citizen perspective. Now suddenly, yeah. So having a family looks like this this really selfish and irresponsible act in light of that 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 perspective so i think that has something to do with it independent of all these other agencies and, and institutions that also have pernicious uh you know depopulation ideas of their own elliot look at look at uh whenever i jump in i'm, I'm worried about cutting someone off Look at Malthusianism. Uh, just Google it. This has been disproven time and time again. But this famous uh, double fish chart uh, with the expanding population and the diminishing resources has terrified unsuspecting dupes for decades. Remember in the 1970s, the Malthusians were pushing the exact same narrative with except with the opposite mechanism, global cooling. So that shows that the, the, the mm -hmm. facts uh, are being conformed to the narrative rather than the narrative to the facts. We, they literally, the left was pushing a, a mini ice age in the 1970s, and they're pushing the same ultimate end, which is Malthusianism. We need to control the population. Uh, if you go and watch... The movie, which just came out on Monday, I'm interviewing the two directors of it later today, called Died Suddenly. They talk about this for about 10 minutes in the film. They, they hit you with all sorts of facts and figures. Most of the global elites, like Mike's talking about at Oxford, have been pushing the idea of, in the West, in places like England and America, uh, Chinese-type uh, uh, two-child cappers and, and law legislation to enforce this since about the 1940s. I never bought into it. I'm a lifelong conservative. I'm a cradle Catholic, but yeah, I am basically a revert for, for all intents and purposes, but I never bought into this stuff. It's clear. I, I grew up with, you know, my father's a geologist. My older brother's a geologist. They're like, look, man, the global warming stuff is bullshit. It's nonsense. It's all a way to push one world government. So I've been awake pretty early on this stuff talking about in fifth and sixth grade and all i know is downstream you watch show nbc shows like frazier the office uh parks and rec they push this myth too the myth of overpopulation all the world could fit in the state of texas with like an acre and a half each and everyone would be perfectly happy so it's it's utter nonsense it's loose I say Luciferians running the show and uh, they hate human beings. They start, I, I'll never forget, I was in college and I saw like a whaling show where they would try to stop whalers. And they, there's a guy, one of the, the Greenpeace guys or whatever, and he's like, look, humans are a cancer on this planet. We're the cockroach, it turns out. This is the view of all the global elites running Malthusianism. It's an utter lie. So, yeah, no, I've never bought into it, needless to say. Hmm. Yeah, that's uh, Paul Watson, who was one of the co-founders of Greenpeace. 
he called humans the aids of the earth <laughs> and one of the three <laughs> founders of the german greens herbert gruel said that the environmental crisis was so acute that the state needed dictatorial powers so there's a link in history between the environmental agenda and dictatorial powers and Patrick Moore, who was one of the former heads of Greenpeace International, uh, he left and he said, he warned that in the name of speaking for the trees and other species, we are faced with a movement that would usher in an era of eco-fascism. And there are some really interesting connections between the Nazi party and the environmentalist movement. Not a lot of people know about these, but for example, uh, Hitler banned medical experiments on animals and the Nazis were also heavily into a romantic anti-science or nature worshipping worldview because of the way in which they tied German identity to the German forests. So there's a guy called Professor Raymond Dominic and he wrote a book called the environmental movement in Germany. And he estimated that around two thirds of the members of Germany's main nature clubs had joined the Nazi party by 1939, compared to just 10% of the rest of the population. So that's a really interesting link between the two movements. And he concludes by arguing that uh, people who treat animals like humans will eventually end up treating humans like animals. And that takes us back to Tim's point about Malthus, which goes all the way back to, what was it? He was writing around 1790s, early, early 1800s, which is, look, population means we're not gonna have enough food and we need to have this elite class who will decide who will live and who will die. And then not long after that, Charles Trevelyan, who was then assistant secretary to the treasury, when the Irish potato famine came along in the 1840s, what did he call it? An effective mechanism for reducing surplus population. And the socialists, they jumped on this. So in Britain, you've got George Bernard Shaw, you've got HG Wells saying things like, if we do desire a certain type of civilization and culture, we must exterminate the sort of people who do not fit into it. And H.G. Wells advocated the extermination of the vicious, helpless, and pauper masses, the weak and silly and pointless. So I definitely agree with Tim. There's an agenda here. I'm just not personally convinced by the sperm count metric because you get guys who have very high sperm count but are still infertile. So there's something going on, but I don't know if it's just that one factor. Hmm. Okay, to stay on the topic uh, of population reduction, but for a particular type, uh, what you described sounds to me like what I've learned is called eugenics. Is that correct? Yeah. And isn't wasn't Margaret Sanger a... Uh, a big eugenics. Mm. Well, first, what is eugenics anyway? And then what does it tie? How does it tie into what we see happening today? Will, you want to pick that one up? What is eugenics? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. So eugenics is a way of thinking you can basically improve the human race according to whatever model you've got by deciding who can breed and, and who can't. And Sanger founded the American Birth Control League in um, 1921, 22. And she was open about the fact that it had racist purposes. And interestingly, uh, this later became, it was renamed Planned Parenthood. So that's the roots of it. That's the roots of birth control. And she saw it as, um, targeting the, the black population in particular. She thought that the problems would um, 
as she saw it, best be solved if there were just fewer black people giving birth. And what you get, Tim will probably know more about this than me, but there's a Supreme Court decision, uh, Buck versus Bell, and the justices legalize sterilization of what they call undesirable citizens. And around the same time in the UK, you've got Mary Stopes, um, they open a, a birth control clinic in London, 1921. So around the 20s, uh, this is a big thing in the US and the UK. So yeah. I'm kind yeah. of... Yeah, that's uh, this is one of the major concerns with, uh, with Amy Coney Barrett was the, the Buck versus Bell uh, verdict and its progeny, the cases progeny, the cases that followed it, allowed for uh, like an emergency power of the federal government, which included sterilization of people that were considered undesirables. I, I'm, I'm trying to think of the other big case uh, that followed it, but this is one of the major yellow flags with uh, fr from a conservative point of view with Amy Coney Barrett's uh, uh, ratification by the Senate. And, and it, it remains a problem because, remember, she had some really bad positions on COVID lockdowns and whatnot. If this is all being unfolded by the same people, I'm not proposing that it is, but perhaps, it almost seems like there's a contradiction of sorts. I'm wondering if you guys could help me understand. So if eugenics is a means of getting rid of undesirables, why is it at the same time we seem to see this push for uh, demographic change? And so the very people that I propose, or I suppose, sorry, uh, that Margaret Sanger was speaking about and these eugenicists are, are hoping for. It seems as if now um, it's almost like they want more <laughs> a quote unquote undesirables to, uh, how, how could I say this, you know, flood the desirable places like America. So what's actually going on there? Is there actually, eugen I, you know, I'm kind of trying to juggle the two. They seem contradictory. Yeah, that's, that's a really, really, really important question. You asked Elliot, I was talking about this with a friend the other day, that it seems to represent some sort of sea change, right? Eugenics got going under all of this, I think, pop Malthusianism in the early, you know, first half of the 20th century in the United States. And it got going under the auspices of standard kind of, I, I guess, white racism, because that's what Margaret Sanger was. That's when leftists still were really guilty, red-faced, white racists. It seemed that the direct object, <clears throat> we're speaking about this transitively, seems to have flopped, seems to have reversed. Because if you turn on the TV recently, you notice that there is literally, that there is some real phenomenon of uh, breeding Caucasian folks out. That the, the, there seems to be some rule of thumb that you can't have a couple that is same, same in, unless they are Chinese or Mexican or black. If there's a, a white person in a couple on commercials, this is how the, uh, the you know Forbes companies work. They all do the same thing. There seems to be a memo saying, yeah, you have to have at least 50% uh, someone else. So now the undesirable seems to be in blood. And, and that is interesting. And that has to be dealt with. Unfortunately, we're fundamentally reactive. We conservatives, people of goodwill, Christians, Catholics, we're just responding to the Soros types or the group represented by the Soros types. We are literally strictly reacting, and that's never a strong position to be in. But I can tell you, they haven't dropped the Malthusianism or the population control. That seems to be the narrative that controls everything. Even Pope Francis's first encyclical, Laudato Si, which seems to be running some sort of point for the UN. I mean, he is not, not just supporting the UN, by the way. People, for Catholics out there, Francis's Laudato Si is celebrated uh, on its anniversary in places like the UN, they just had this last week. He's been flirting over the last six years with releasing a new Ten Commandments and their climate commandments and their 
really all about propping up the UN agenda to control the population, though Francis has to be more subtle in the way he supports it. So I would say uh, what we do know is the global elites, country to country, support getting rid of a certain population. As long as they're getting rid of some population, they're happy. It did, does seem to have switched from undesirable uh, people of color. It's not a term I use that often, but now it's people <laughs> of, of uh, less, significantly less color, white people. That, you have to admit that if you're honest, right? Yeah, it, you, it's funny. I sent this to my family in a, in a chat yesterday. Uh, my wife is white, and um, I saw a meme. It was a headline, a news article. It said, white birthing women are terrorists. The terror unleashed on the world by white women and their insistence on producing white babies <laughs> continues to plague black communities and keep them from success. All right, once again, we'll try this. Tim, you were, you were talking about uh, t deep Luciferic uh, intentions. <laughs> And uh, Will, I don't know if you heard me before, but I was I, I brought up. Oh, Will disappeared again. <laughs> it's just one of those days, fellas. Mm. Uh, Tim, I would yeah, I would love to hear about uh, deep Luciferian intentions. Yeah, we'll probably have to do a deep dive show into this. What, yeah. Why? Why do global elites want to kill at least some segment of the population? If we look at the 1940s through now, nearly you know. 80 years later, I, I think you have to go into es esotericism, uh, the Illuminists, what they want to do, dare I say, uh, the F word Freemasons. Their goal seems to be outright evil. So I don't think it does matter to them as much. I don't think it's the idea fise to, to ascertain, to pinpoint which demographic needs to be the one being exterminated or population control. I think they need to have one and they're picking on the weak, the weak group at uh, the given moment in the decade. That would be my guess. It's definitely uh, whitey at this point. And <laughs> I, I mean, I think that's, that's what we've shown here. So. Yeah. It's uh, interesting. I've watched in my lifetime, the tables turn from this idea that, you know, there's uh, racism against blacks and now it's open racism. It's, it's interesting to watch open racism against whites. So it's almost confusing. It's like, which way are we going? But I guess that's what the confusion or uh, diabolical disorientation really looks like. Huh? Agreed. I, I just say the, the fixed idea, the focal point, is they want the Malthusianism, therefore they want population control. And you know they, they tend to do it through environmental scare narratives because it's macroeconomic and macroscopic enough that no one can tell whether or not it's true. I mean, I don't, who really knows, unless you know to mistrust everything they tell you, who really knows how much UV is escaping through the ozone layer? Remember, that was the story in the 90s. They've just, right. they've run with different narratives, slightly competing narratives over the last 30 years, even basically our late teen and adult lives. They've, they've modified. It was ozone this, ozone that, greenhouse effect in the earlier 90s. Uh, then they found out that the planet was actually cooling from about 2006 onward. So they, they stopped saying global warming and they started saying climate change. Uh, now their problem is that, that the, the temperature is actually cooling. So they don't, and they don't care which group they're gonna beat up on. Before it was blacks, now it's whites. They just seem to have an even more startling teleology fixed here, which is they need some group to beat up on and uh, the, the ultimate goal is served by having some group of humans that are beaten up on. We're all, we're all sacred parts of God's creation. So if the Luciferians really want to subvert the natural order and the supernatural order to the extent they can, all they have to be doing is uh, harmful stuff to human populations, and they're getting their job done. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes. All right. Yes. I just dropped it off. I'm not sure what it was. Elliot was asking about being in an interracial marriage, yeah? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so we're yeah. just talking about the difference between, you know, the eugenics idea and now what we see is sort of a de demographic change where there's a lot of, you know, I'm a mixed race man. So, but I'm just looking at this objectively. There's a big push to, uh, some would say, dilute the white race and then to blend us all into one, you know, mixed mass. What to, My question was, what benefit would that have to the global elites if that's, you know, what they're really trying to do? Well, the, the Catholic view is that all human beings share a common ancestor and there's a sense in, a sense in which we all form one family. So it's the opposite of the materialistic reductionist viewpoint that race is somehow the supreme form of identity that a human being has and race can become a kind of idol in that sense, which is why you often see people who give up on political liberalism but aren't christian turning to race worship like the nazis for example mm. and you see it on some areas of the the dissident right today as well we've got to have something to bow down to right so race must be it for some people if you go beyond just your ego then the next form of pride that you identify with the next kind of big self is your race so if they are trying to merge all races into one that's an odd goal because that's the kind of transcendentalism um, which Christianity poses as a challenge to the tribalism of materialism. So I would go more with Tim's interpretation that the goal is population reduction overall and the specific race that's most targeted might change from generation to generation. Although I would note that even now, abortion is still highest among blacks so it's much higher among blacks than whites but i think whites are probably inviting attack more now than before because <clears throat> there's a sense of self-hatred i think white people are ashamed of themselves and their civilization and that is one of the best ways to destroy a culture you don't need bombs if you can make people ashamed to even exist and not want to have children, not want to carry on your culture, your heritage, then job done without a single bomb dropped. Mm -hmm. You see this uh, with Thanksgiving. Yesterday was Thanksgiving here in the US. Yeah. And um, there's this big push to erase Thanksgiving and other American holidays uh, out of this idea that uh, America is somehow evil because it was stolen <laughs> from the people that are here. And so, you know, I, I love the idea that the pushback, I love the pushback, which is conquered, not stolen. It seems as if, you know, there are throughout history, we praise conquerors. But in our world, in America today, it seems as if the conqueror is um, is denigrated and it's now not considered a conquest. It's a stealing of sorts. And so you got a lot of, you're right, a lot of white guilt going on here and uh, maybe part of the reason why people are, are swallowing this idea that white women are terrorists for making babies. So very good point. The, uh, the interesting thing about that, Elliot, is that uh, the cherry picking that goes on with that thinking, right? Mm. Where people say, well, you know, the nation states of the Western world were unjustly acquired because of conquest and, and you know, enslavement and, and bloodshed. Show me any other sovereign nation that presently exists in the world that wasn't born of that very same uh, metaphysical background, right? Nobody is agitating to undo Japan and give it back to the Ainu. Nobody is agitating to, um, you know, give the uh, North America back to the Native Americans and then break it up further and give Apache land back to the Comanche, back to the, the Sioux, et cetera, et cetera. So at every existing nation state, there needs to be some metaphysical cutoff where we say this is where the nation state began and the the secular sins of the father, so to speak, have been erased and we're all we're all jointly citizens and all the stuff behind it. We're not going to count on the moral ledger. Otherwise, if we're going to be fair about that, then we need to do it across the world. Let's let's roll everything back to a pre-colonial, uh, you know, refit the map to, to 1300s. Uh, every nation state needs to be undone because they're un they've unjustly acquired their land. 
but but we don't do that. We just have this lopsidedness of saying that Western countries bear this original sin that other countries don't, and it's it's complete bullshit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, those are excellent points by Will and Mike. I just add this small tweaker. It's with all due respect, since yesterday was Thanksgiving. When the, the Spanish got here and then the rest of the Europeans, what they beheld was not a civilization in the strict sense of common law. You know, common law in, in the British tradition uh, imposes the idea of something called a fee simple. This means the idea that land can be legally acquired and owned and uh, with exclusionary rights and other property rights held as a bundle of sticks that you're claiming against all others. The Indians, whatever you call them, they did not have a civilization proper in the sense that they didn't have common land. Like they were, they were roving over the land. There's nothing to steal. They didn't have the idea of a fee simple. They didn't have the idea of lessor lessee rights. They didn't have the idea of uh, the economic ergonomic system whereby goods and services were traded according to the natural law as it plays with the positive law. I'm not saying they didn't have a barter system and they had lots of the trappings of a civilization, but you can't say something was stolen unless folks had the notion in their society, well, well vested, of the fee simple. Fee simple, the idea that a piece of a human being can own a piece of the earth, which is idiosyncratic. It's unlike any other piece of the earth. That was, sorry, that was a European idea. It's a natural law idea, but it comes from Europe. Maybe this is why they want to kill us, uh, whiteies, at this point. But you can't, you can't impose that on a bunch of people that came here and beheld nomads wandering over the land who are, in many cases, killing each other. That's just, uh, it doesn't work. So we've discussed, I mean, we kind of went back and forth here. We discussed uh, how the attack now is cherry picked and cyclical and sort of just evolves or changes over time. Um, but the original attack in the garden was against gender, man, man and women pitting against uh, race is one thing, but at its root, the pitting against of man and women is Satan's ultimate and primordial first attack and we see it big time with what our discussion is here today an attack on masculinity that's shown itself in the uh in the way of declining sperm i would like to sort of come full circle or wrap up with you guys in terms of <coughs> what then is our responsibility as men today in terms of uh preserving masculine virtue and and, and populating the planet, you know, undoing the undoing by, you know, raising families and being fathers and patriarchy and things of that nature. Where, what does the world, what does our activity moving forward look like in contradiction to this, uh, you know, these changes? I think there's a, a very profound sense in which emasculation begins with contraception and the agenda we picked out today about population reduction it's not a coincidence if you go back to 1965 president johnson in his state of the <clears throat> union address said i will seek new ways to use our knowledge to help deal with the explosion in world population and the growing scarcity in world resources and then in the same year, 1965, Margaret Sanger achieves her life goal. The US Supreme Court declared laws against birth control unconstitutional. So what we've got then is the two things dovetailing. Birth control is essential to this agenda. And if you want to start undoing it, then we recognize that contraception is contrary to natural law and you're getting something very fundamental wrong about sex and about the family, and therefore you are rotting society at the root. So 
Don't act surprised when you see the consequences of that. And alongside that population reduction agenda that goes with contraception, you've also got sexual deviance being promoted. Who opens the gender identity clinic in the early 1960s? John Money. And he does the first sex change operations. And he calls even sex murder just a different preference. And he advocates sex games for children. So that's another arrow added to this bow that's been aimed at the West. And until parents recognize that we are now seeing the full flowering of what money started in the 60s at the gender identity clinic today with the trans phenomenon the drag queen story hour etc what, what are we honestly expecting to do about it people are just letting it happen homeschooling if necessary is the answer part of what i hear you saying uh sounds a lot like one of my favorite terms from Tim's book, weaponized chastity. And so uh, I'd like to uh, toss it to Tim there in terms of, you know, how is it that we could make things better moving forward by weaponizing chastity in the way that Will talked about before? Three addenda to what Will said, and I'll, I'll talk about weaponized chastity in, in point number three, but I just wanted to point out yeah. That uh, U.S. Supreme Court case that he's referring to, most people probably heard of it in 1965. It's called Griswold versus Casey, 1965, where a lot of folks don't understand the implications. The Supreme Court made it illegal for the states to make contraception illegal. And that was followed up four years later in 1969 by a case called Stanley versus Georgia, where the Supreme Court made it illegal for any of the 50 states to make Pornography illegal. That was followed up four years later by Roe, which made it illegal for the states to make abortion illegal. 30 years later, you had Lawrence versus Texas in 1993 that made it illegal for any of the individual states who are supposed to be the muscle lawmakers to make uh, sodomy illegal. And then about 20 years later, you, you, they came up with Obergefell versus Hodges which made it illegal for the states to illegalize so-called gay marriage. And that was all done on the same legal theory, the 14th Amendment, something called substantive due process. It's, it's bullshit. But it's not just that it was <clears throat> in the culture in America to contracept. I guess it must have been those crazy radical 60s, right? That's what normies say. No, this was a systematic program whereby the Supreme Court gained a majority of Freemasons in the late 1940s, after World War II, when all this shit began, uh, they had seven of nine that uh, formalized the separation of church and state, which was the opposite of the First Amendment here in, in a case called Everson in 1947. And they, that number of Freemasons on the court rose to eight out of nine in the 50s. Famous Hugo Black uh, just needs to be looked into, and he's behind a lot of this stuff. Uh, KKK... ACLU supporting Freemason, Justice Hugo Black is behind a lot of this stuff. Point number two, the popular push for contraception had only been circulating since 1930. Dig this. 1930 was the first time in 1,930 years of Christendom that even Protestants, our God love them, our, 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 our goofy brethren in Christ, they accepted at something called the Lambeth Conference in 1930, contraception. There had been no Christians that contracepted before 1930. So look at the turnaround time between points one and two. Between 1930 and 1965, contraception became popular enough for there to not be a popular outcry when the uh, Freemasons on the Supreme Court topped down forced it to be legal, illegalized its Ill illegalization. This is really, really staggering turnaround time, 1930 to 1965. And it essentially dropped the testosterone, if you ask me, and hmm. turned the family against the kids, turned husband and wife against each other. It's central to feminism. This brings me to point number three. Sorry for the long answer, Elliot. You said that correctly, that the original sin is the sin of feminism. 
Adam sitting through omission, Eve acting like a man sitting through commission. Yes, it's the alpha of all sins. It's the, the, the need for a redeemer, Christ Jesus, uh, was this, the original sin of feminism. Well, it's also the omega. Sister Lucy, if you know Fatima, wrote in her fourth uh, journal entry that the final assault of Lucifer on the world will come through an assault on the family and an assault on the very nature of men and women. Right? She wrote that in the middle of the 20th century. Sound familiar? So the gender bending was Satan's alpha attack, his first, and it's his <clears throat> omega attack. And I would just say, what does this tell you? The solution is simple. might not be easy, but it's simple. Weaponized chastity. So to be chaste, you don't, if you're a married person, you don't have to be celibate. Just have chaste, open to life sex. Procreate lots of good little Christian soldiers. And, um, and if you're not yet married, then you got to wait. Uh, it's, I think it's that simple. That's how we undo this stuff, along with prayer and fasting. Amen. Michael, what say you? So, uh, yeah, so picking up on Will and Tim's point there, it just reminded me of uh, on Will and my podcast that, that we do, our book club, one of the commenters, they made the point, they said, uh, ejaculate and evacuate equals emasculate. And they're, you know, commenting on the, the red pill uh, pickup artist community, you know, which I would shame, shamefully was, was a part of. Um, but you know, it, that last point really, it really drives it home as to what, what is the eventual civilizational consequence of male, uh, hyper promiscuity. You know, I think a, a lot of men, uh, these days, you know, listening on, on the internet, you know, to, to folks like us and, and in this sphere, uh, don't really want to accept the connection, right? They, they want to think that they can have their cake and eat it too and blame the feminists, right? This is, right. This is all women's fault that, you know, this, there's no connection to, to male uh, promiscuity and fornication and civilizational collapse. And I think that there needs to be a, a hard recognition of that hypocrisy and, and where those things connect, uh, that men collectively need to stop um, venerating and uh, seeing the the Hugh Hefner ideal as being somehow honorable or somehow worthy of emulation. And that should, in, in fact, be looked at as, as deeply, deeply shameful and something that socially we should stigmatize. Uh, so I think that's one thing that could be helpful. Uh, obviously, the, the points... Uh, that Will and Tim have both made of, you know, re return to, to the family, family values, homeschooling, etc. cetera. Uh, the only last point I think I would make is counter to the globalist thinking, you know, that pervades so much of our media. I think one of the um, antidotes would be localism, subsidiarity, think, think locally, everything, you know, e even not even so much nationally, but you know, what does your, lo you know, what's, what's happening in your local community that you can affect what's happening at your town halls, what's happening in your, your, uh, you know, your local PTA meetings, etc. I think those are lever points uh, where, uh, or fulcrum points where change, positive change can still be affected. Uh, so even not just thinking just nationally, but just locally, what, it, what is it that we can actually have direct impact upon? to counter the, the, the globalist, you know, world citizen, uh, set of uh, ideas. Uh, so that would be my last sort of point. Thanks, Mike. So, uh, just to kind of circle back to the weaponized chastity idea that, you know, perhaps the, the steering wheel is in our hands as men and that we are at the helm. It's up to us to do something about it and we have the power to do so, but it sounds so counter intuitive to our culture, especially it's so funny because Tim mentioned how, you know, how rapidly the onset of this acceptance of, uh, of, uh, contraception, fornication and things, things of this nature since the 1930s. I mean, it was just like yesterday. Um, but if you ask most people today, they wouldn't even consider that there could be something wrong with it. What do you mean? How could you, are you kidding me? It's almost like a right to contracept. 
So my a question I'd like to throw out to you guys uh, is this. Given that it's so counterintuitive and that those who hear it just cringe at how hard it must be not to jerk off, watch porn, screw, uh, do dating apps and fornicating, all these things just sound like hell. It sound like, why would anybody want to do that? Those are difficult things. Why would anybody, you know, besides the Catholic answer that, well, it's a sin and you're going to go to hell. But on a practical, on a practical day-to-day -day civilization level, what would be the fruits of a world where men did weaponize their chastity and take control in this way? An imaginary world, if we could play utopia, what would the world look like if men were chased? <laughs> what would be repaired and what could we create? Will, what say you? We've got to go back to the fact that the, the socialists were the ones who had the fantasy of a promiscuous past originally. So uh, Bakofen, a German attorney, wrote a book called The Mother Right, where he just imagined that at one point in human history, there were no families and everyone was just promiscuous. It was a big orgy. And this is the kind of thing that we need to get back to. So it's, it's weird to me that a lot of people on the right today, looking at the activities of the left, they all cling to this idea that monogamy is somehow contrary to human nature. That's exactly the idea that the socialists were push, pushing in France in the 1830s, 1840s. And they wanted sexual freedom. And Tim's right that the, the free love sexual revolution, it goes way back before the 1960s. It's been a long time coming. So that was the spearhead. The, the, the sexual liberation was the spearhead of the political control, which is what E. Michael Jones has argued so well in his books. So a simple answer, Elliot, to your question is we get back strong families and the male authority that goes with them because the motive for pushing promiscuity was weakening families and men get authority within the family as the leaders appointed by God. So if you want to weaken society, weaken the family, do that by undermining male authority within it. And you do that with the honey trap of so-called free love, but it actually comes at the cost of basically your masculinity, and your entire culture that goes down the drain yeah yeah listen to me ellie you're trying to parse the great from the small here what is, why listen to christians isn't that just doctrine you know from from fuddy duddy ned flanders types mm -hmm. that you know are probably too scared to fornicate anyway or, or, mm -hmm. or aren't capable of it <laughs> that's a bunch of nonsense look every single man i've known that bought into every single married man that claims to have in his past life bought into the idea of have fun before you get married. Marriage is going to suck after you get married. Basically are living out a self-fulfilling prophecy. They're punk ass bitches that live <laughs> hellish lives that make marriage look awful. They're, I wouldn't want their lives. They're not in charge of anything around their homes. They're henpecked. They're betas. They're cocked. The only dudes I know that run their household are guys that met their eventual wives when they were somewhat young, or if they met them a little bit older, they knew exactly what they wanted to do and they ran their relationship the way that Christianity and really the natural law tells you to order a relationship. Be good. Try to wait for marriage. If you don't wait for marriage, I'm, I'm not saying I, I ticked all these boxes perfectly, though. At the very least, you ought to be propping up the patriarchy. None of the guys that live in the suburbs that are cucked that I hear with all due respect around my neighborhood, at the market, at the bank, whatever, being screeched at by these heinous wives, none of these guys are Christian guys that waited to do it the patriarchy way. They're all guys that were eating up the strip club, porn addicted, probably still porn addled honestly, in their, their mercilessly loveless marriages. Mm -hmm. I mean, it sounds like I'm coming out hard, but if you see some people see my relationship with my wife or Elliot's with his wife or Will's, 
And they're like, that's cool. How do I get that? Well, you got to put in the work, right? The guys that are hitting up the porn club, the, the strip club, watching porn, all of that, trying to, trying to get what, what tail they can, when they can. These are not the guys that are headed toward being patriarchs. These are the guys headed toward being cucked. It's a strong, strong correlation. I see it all <laughs> over the place. Dr. Michael, you have gone from uh, promiscuity, pickup, dating, meeting girls, trying to get laid. That lifestyle, you had a reversion. You came back to the faith, and now you're a chaste man. What do you see of the other end of it? Why would you make that decision, and what is the hope for the future? I would say um, at some point it was a recognition that uh, that I was more than just a, um, a rat in a cage kid in a button to get a cocaine pellet. You know, that, that being human and being a man involved, we're, we're ordered towards something higher than just satisfying base appetites. And uh, once you come to that recognition that we are born and God has given us dignity and a certain uh, telos, uh, then suddenly these, these baser pleasures, they, they look disgusting. And you realize, oh, wait a second, I've... I've been the, uh, you know, I'm the prodigal son in the, um, you know, in the trough of the pigs and I need to start, uh, start walking back, back to my father. And, uh, it's been a long walk and, and, you know, I'm, I'm still walking back, but, uh, that's, that's been the, uh, the process, I suppose. Um, for me, it was, I, I think it wasn't even something internal to that worldview. It was when, when trans happened external to it, I went, holy, wow. Uh, this, the, the world's falling apart and uh, maybe my own individual actions have something, something to do with it. Uh, what, what, a, what a surprising realization, huh? Um, so yeah, I think that that is the long and short of my, my path and where I am right now. Um, so yeah, I'm just, just trying to reorder my life and get back to being an, an upstanding uh, Catholic man and uh, uh, what will be, will be. Dr. Mike, you got to show it will, right? I, I've seen you guys get together. What yeah. else you yeah. got going on? And uh, what can you let my viewers know about you and your projects and how they can get in, involved, brother? Awesome. Thanks. Yeah, so Will and, and uh, me, we run a, a weekly uh, podcast. Uh, it's a course, ongoing course called The Best of the West Book Club. Uh, it uh, runs on Tuesdays on Will's channel. And uh, it'll soon to be... What book? Uh, what book? Right now we're going through um, Plato, uh, the uh, chapter eight and nine of the uh, Republic. We did Ed Fazer's uh, The Last Superstition and uh, Vaclav Havel's uh, Power of the Powerless. And uh, we'll be doing Tim's book next. Uh, so nice. we got our whole book of, the, book of the month we're doing that's all sort of Western civilization focused. Uh, so that's on Will's channel. Uh, my channel, uh, the Patriot Philosopher, you can find uh, on YouTube and on iTunes. And uh, m most of my writing is on Substack. And uh, Tim and I also have our recent book called uh, Don't Go to College. And uh, you can find that on Regnery Press, on uh, Amazon, and at all your local uh, book vendors. Nice. Thank you. Tim, you got a bunch of books you've written, bro. Uh, case for patriarchy as I, was I assume what Michael was referring to um, just allow us to get to know a little bit more about you where you're at and where people can consume your oh actually I went on your website yesterday and I was checking out all the courses you have too you're doing a lot of cool stuff man yeah thanks I mean that's that's a lot of fun I, I'm, I'm a teacher by trade before I got like Will we both got got uh, got the axe and then kind of went out on our own. So yeah, I think I have 15 or 16 courses, Western civilizational courses you're not going to get anywhere else. Go to timothyjgordon.com. Thanks, Elliot. But yeah, my, I have four books. I'm, I'm not sure if they're doing Catholic Republic or The Case for Patriarchy. Uh, it's my first and my third book. Oh. I also have a book called uh, uh, Self-Style uh, Rules for Retrogrades, and then the, that last one I co-authored with Mike called Don't Go to College. But I tell you, people, yeah, uh, Elliot Hulse, 
fans, Elliot Holtz subscribers, Will Nolan subscribers, Michael Robillard subscribers. We, we probably don't say it often enough on this stream, on any of our streams. We appear weekly on Fridays, but we bounce from channel to channel. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know of any other people doing this model. I think it works well. But in order to do that, you guys have to um, go subscribe to all four channels so you can get the CMAS podcast. That's week. right. Or else, yeah, we, I, I haven't been saying it on my channel. I need this <laughs> mm -hmm. so, so everyone go subscribe to Will's, Will Nolan's channel, Timothy Gordon's channel, Michael Robillard's channel on YouTube. And you're, here, you're probably already subscribed to Elliot's. But um, that's how you get CMAS content every Friday morning. Uh, it's not just once a month. It only appears on each one of our channels once a month so timothy gordon rules for retrograde is my channel and uh it's as always an honor doing this with you gentlemen i think it's the most important task uh that youtube could could subserve at this point i, really I also want to say i really love your book uh rules for retrogrades very clever title uh rule right. for rules for radicals who is the author of that and what was you know what was that all about and this seems to be your counter your counter to it Saul Linsky, mm -hmm. who, who was uh, knew Hillary Clinton and was an inspiration to Barack Obama, he wrote a book called Rules for Radicals, 13 Rules to really, he, he admits, uh, like Karl Marx, he admits his work is subversionary and he really wants to do the, the bidding of the devil. It's very effective stuff. He also infiltrated in the Midwestern Catholic Church uh, very, very deeply. And now we have things like the uh, uh, Catholic Campaign for Human Development that has ideological roots that probably trace to Saul Alinsky's infiltration mm. of the church. There's a new book out called um, The Devil and Bella Dodd. Oh. That, you guys have to look into that. That's, that's by Paul Kanger, the, the Reaganite, who also wrote The Devil and Karl Marx. It's all about how Bella Dodd was tasked by Stalin himself She's a, an Italian and an American to put 1,100 uh, communist men into the seminaries, uh, preferably homosexual communist men, in the 30s, and that Archbishop Fulton Sheen uh, reconverted her to the faith, and she had to repent for what she did. But I, I, I knew all this story until, and I knew she had some connection with Alinsky. I didn't know that it was Sheen that told her not to name names because she said four of her guys, four of her plants, had risen very high even into the cardinalate. <clears throat> Sheen was the one that said, don't name names, which is disappointing because I'm a big Sheen fan and I wish she had. But um, the point is that what you see, people out there who are like, why are these four guys Catholic? What the hell's going on with the church? It was a direct Stalinist attack on the personnel of the church through... Saul Linsky's rules for radicals types of infiltration come directly from Stalin in this case. And uh, they attacked the church because they knew that is the real target, the one true faith. And mm -hmm. yes, our church looks otherwise ostensibly like it's in really a bad way. But hopefully that helps your viewers who aren't Catholic to see why all of us are so uh, uh, in it to win it for Roman Catholicism. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you, know, you got to know. You got to know these things. Will, you're so prolific these days, though, dude. I'm seeing your sub stacks, your videos. I mean, you're just pumping out a ton of content. Uh, please uh, share a little bit more about what you got going on, bro. Yeah, like Tim, I'm a teacher by trade, fired from the UK's top all boys school for a lecture on patriarchy. And then you can get my stuff on my YouTube channel, Nota Knows, and then my sub stack as well. Lots of articles, a bit more academic, more focused on literature and philosophy there. There was one that went out today on Keats's poem, La Belle Dame Sans Merci, which is about how a knight basically loses his mission and gets emasculated through simping. So mm. people might want to look at that one <laughs> as a follow-up to today's talk. Awesome. Very cool. Well, I love you guys. I appreciate you guys. I appreciate everybody watching. And viva Cristo Rey. I'll see you guys next week. Thanks, Elliot. Thanks, thank you. You got it.